That's good. How many would say amen? Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, the second chapter. Timothy chapter 2, and here we find the Apostle Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And uh, I've got some pens and paper up up here for you. And I believe we've got some things that the Lord has downloaded, according to Jared. He has downloaded to me, and I'm going to download them to you. Is that all right? So if if you want to take some notes, I encourage you to do so. I was in the gas station yesterday. How many know the Lord's speaking? God is always speaking. And, uh, you know, these are perilous times that we live in. We know that. It's hard. As Pastor Josh was saying, you know, during worship, man, it's tough. Uh, But they are exciting days, aren't they? They are exciting days. But I looked right there at the gas station and look at this. The USA Today Special Edition Jesus. Look at that. (laughs) I mean, and and this is a whole thing. This isn't one or two pages. Hang on. It's 40 pages. Look at this. And I mean, it's just awesome. Article after article, breakdown. And I tell you what, I just got to skim through it real quickly, and it just looked like an awesome article. So how many know God is speaking? And uh, I just love the fact that, you know, Sometimes God makes our, our work so easy for us. You know, he just, he, he puts it right there. And you know, we always talk about the Christmas time season and Easter resurrection. And how many know we need to be sharing our faith with others? So I just encourage you to do that. Man, that just encouraged me as I seen that. Second Timothy chapter two, we'll begin reading in verse one. Paul says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me Among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many are thankful for the ministers of the gospel? The Bible says that we are to know them that labor among us. Verse 3, you therefore must endure. Everybody say endure. In another scripture it says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But now look at this, verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship. Everybody say hardship. Okay, so that kind of explains some things. Does that kind of explain some of the stuff you had to go through this week? You therefore must endure hardship as a what? A good soldier of Jesus Christ. Watch this now, verse 4. No one, everybody say no one. No one engaged in warfare entangles. Think about that when you get entangled in something. You get caught up and you just, you're stuck. No one entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, I've always said this. I've always said that uh, there's no draftees in the army of God, that you have to volunteer, you have to enlist yourself. But this kind of contradicts that, doesn't it? It says we are to please him who enlisted us. Look at your neighbor and tell him, God handpicked you. <laughs> we are on accidents going somewhere to happen. Come on, somebody. Hello? Amen. Amen. That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Huh, okay. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this is the day that you have made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for your spirit, your presence, your anointing that we've already felt in this house today. Lord, we thank you that you've kept us safe another week. We thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. And Lord, as we come to this most holy time, as we break forth the word of life, I pray for your anointing to overtake me, to overtake every ear and every heart that's in this place. And Father, may we get that download this morning. May we receive the word that we need to hear from you. Lord, we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. And amen. Now notice here what Paul says in verse number four to young Timothy. He says, no one engaged in warfare. How many understand that we are in a fight for our lives? that we are in a spiritual battle. 
that we are in a spiritual battle that often manifests itself in the natural realm. Come on now. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, how many know that's easy to do? But Paul is admonishing us here not to let that happen. No one engaged in spiritual warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this natural life that he may please him who enlisted you as a soldier. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Amen? Now, for anyone who has ever been in any branch of the military, you know that once you enlist in Uncle Sam's army, you are not your own anymore. Amen? I said, you're not your own anymore. You don't get up when you want to get up. You don't sleep in till noon. Come on, somebody. But you're going to get up at the crack of the whip, a crack of dawn is what you're going to get up at, and you're going to go out and you're going to run, and you're going to do the push-ups and the sit-ups. Come on, somebody. You're not your own anymore. And not only are you not your own anymore, but once you become a member of the U.S. military, you quickly find out that you only have one agenda in life. Everybody say one. one. Only one. You quickly find out that that one agenda is to become a soldier. A soldier. The title of our message this morning is this, a one-track mind. A one-track mind. In our world today, when we hear this statement, a one-track mind, it defines someone who has their mind made up. It defines someone who is determined to accomplish a certain goal. Oftentimes, it defines someone who has a closed mind. You ever met anybody that had a closed mind? Closed mind. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not so good. We'll just go, we'll just leave it at that. But most of all, this term, a one track mind, it defines someone who is using their mind. Yeah, I think about three of you got it. Look at your neighbor and tell them a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Let me say this, don't let anybody else think for you. How many understand we live in a nation now where our government is trying to think for us? Oh, come on, you ain't shouting as good as I'm preaching already. Don't let anybody think for you. Don't let anybody steal that God-given choice that you have. Don't waste your mind. Mind is a terrible thing to waste. Don't waste something as valuable as your mind in which God has blessed you with. How many understand your mind is a blessing from the Lord? It's a gift from God. I believe our mind is second only to our never dying eternal soul. Let me say this, your mind could very well be the most valuable asset you ever own. Yeah. Now, you, 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 you would say, well, pastor, my soul is. My soul is the most valuable asset I own. Well, that's true, and I believe you could win that argument. But let me ask you this. What chooses or what determines where your soul is going to spend eternity? my mind. My soul doesn't choose, but my mind chooses. Was it Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How did he say that? He said that because he had a made up mind. Look at your neighbor and ask him, is your mind made up this morning? Your mind is your most valuable asset. Now, let me say this, if the church, and we are the church, look at your neighbor and say, we're the church. This isn't the church. We are the church. If the church ever needed to have a made-up mind, it's now. How many would say amen? 
If the church ever needed direction and an agenda and a vision, it's now. How many would say amen? If we ever needed to know what we believe and why I believe it, it's now. With compromise running rampant in throughout the church, we need to be rooted and grounded in the word as never before. How many would say amen? I believe if the church ever needed a one-track mind, it's now. It's now. But you see, the devil wants to divide our mind. How many understand a house divided against itself cannot stand? The devil wants to divide and conquer our minds. The devil wants to distract us. Has anybody noticed that? The devil wants to distract us from praying and going to the house of God and being encouraged and so on and so forth. The devil wants to steal our direction, our vision, and our energy. Anybody notice that? How many have noticed that the devil wants to, wants to, wants to get us busy? Hello? The devil wants to get us busy and steal our time. How many understand your time is precious? How many understand you, ha you only have so much time up on this earth? How many knew that the devil is a time thief? If you don't believe the devil is a time thief, for one week, take an inventory of what you do every day. I mean, don't change it when you start taking inventory of it. Just do what you normally do in any given week, and I I'm sure you will see that the devil is a time thief. How much time we waste on television, the internet, sports, this, that, the other. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And I'm right there with you. I'm a fellow struggler right there with you. The devil's a time thief. You see, the devil wants to get us busy so we won't have any time to do what God has called us to do. How many know why you're here? Amen. Church, can I tell you, Jesus knew why he came to this earth. Yes. He was born to die. Yes. He came for only one reason, and that was to go to the cross. Come on, somebody. And how many know the only reason we were born was to bring God glory? Come on, to bring pleasure to the heart of God. That once we got saved, we would point other men, women, boys, and girls to Jesus. Look at your neighbor and remind them that's the only reason you're here. Oh, I know you want to find that beautiful gal. I know you want to find that handsome hunk of man. Come on, somebody. And you want to get married and you want to have the American dream. You want to live in the little white house with a little picket fence and two and a half kids. I know all that. I don't know how you have two and a half kids, but that's what they say the average is. I mean, that's all great, fine and dandy. But listen, that's not the real reason why we're here. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't forget why you're here. The devil gets us busy. Look at the word busy, B-U-S-Y. You know what that stands for? Being under Satan's yoke. There it is right there, busy. Being under Satan's yoke. Now, I know the Bible says we are to be busy about the Father's business, but let me say this. Can I tell you that sometimes we can get busy with doing good things and it can be the wrong thing? How many know good can be an enemy to that which is best? We could be home, reading the Bible, doing something, but if it was God's will for us to be out witnessing to somebody or doing something or doing this and doing that, how many know we're out of the will of God? We're missing God. So don't always think just because you're doing something good that it's the perfect will of God. But we are to be led of the Spirit. How many want to be led of the Holy Spirit? Don't just be busy for the sake of being busy. But make sure you're being busy about the right stuff. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. I'm convinced today that the devil wants to divide and conquer our minds. Anybody been attacked in your mind the last six months? <laughs> I thought I was in the right place. I mean, it's just been amazing. I'll just leave it at that. It's been amazing some of the tricks and the games and the schemes that the devil has used against me. Come on, somebody. I mean, I'm talking about some things that I got the victory over many years ago. And the devil tries to bring it back up and says, you know what? You ain't going to make, you might as well just give up and go back to the way you used to live, the way you used to think, the way you used to treat people. Come on, somebody. The devil knows how to mess with your mind. Look 
Look what James chapter 1 says about our mind. James chapter 1 verse 8. He is a double-minded man, unstable in some of his ways. Most of his ways. No, an unstable man, or a, I'm sorry, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we see here that double-mindedness leads to instability. But do we really understand what double-mindedness is? One foot in the church, one foot in the world, half of our brain trying to do right, the other half thinking crazy. Come on, somebody. Any humans in the house this morning? Half the time we react in the spirit, half the time we react in the flesh. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How many understand this morning that life can be hard enough as it is? Life can be hard enough as it is without you and I creating our own drama. Without you and I not being our own worst enemy. Hello? And let me say, that is what double-mindedness is does. It causes instability. It causes confusion. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but I got enough drama where I don't need to create my own drama. Look at your neighbor and tell him, save the drama for your mama. <laughs> I feel sorry for mama, whoever that is. I'm just saying. Double-mindedness leads to instability, and it's instability that we don't need. You know, it's hard enough just to do the right thing, take care of your business, handle your business. Come on, somebody. It's hard enough because you're going to have to fight against the enemy. You're going to have to fight against the world without creating your own drama, without being your own worst enemy. And that's what double-mindedness leads to. You see, what we need is a one-track mind. A one-track mind. I said a one-track mind. How many right now, listen, you're so, you're so full, you, you, you're having a hard time concentrating on what I'm saying because you're thinking about a million and one things. You're thinking about what's going to go on this week. You're thinking about the ball game this afternoon or the race or whatever. I got to get this done this week. da 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 and when we come to the house of God, we can't even concentrate on the word of God because we got all this. Boy, Jared was right on this morning when we need to get rid of some stuff. So we can get a new word, so we can get a fresh word. How many want fresh manna? You see, if we don't have a one-track mind, and if we've got too many things going on, then that leads to confusion. Everybody say confusion. confusion. Look what the Bible says about confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author or source of confusion, but of peace. Everybody say peace but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. I don't know about you, but it's hard to find peace today. Everywhere I go, it just seems like stuff is in turmoil, that the littlest, simplest task gets blown out of proportion, and how something should be so simple and so easy, it's just... Now, I know that's the attack of the enemy, but how many know sometimes we don't help matters? How many know sometimes we bite off more than we can chew? Man, I'm preaching to the choir right there. I mean, I burn my candles at both ends 24-7. I mean, sometimes I catch myself coming. And we pay a price for that, don't we? It's because we don't have our priorities in order. 
You see, if there's something that you're involved in and it's just a mess and it's confusing and you can't find peace in it and it's just a bunch of turmoil, can I tell you, it's probably not God. You say, but pastor, it's a good thing. And, and, and perhaps even you feel like you're called to do this. Well, you know what? It might be God, but it might not be his timing. And I would just say this, if you're trying to do something, and even if it's a good thing, but if it's just not working out and things aren't lining up and things aren't coming together, just take a step back a little bit and look at the big picture and see perhaps maybe what God is trying to speak to you about. Is that good? Is that all right? Because how many understand we got to pick and choose our battles wisely? Because if not, we're going to be so strung out. We're going to be here. We're going to be there. We're going to be fighting this and fighting that. Pretty soon we ain't going to have any energy. We ain't going to have any strength. We ain't going to have any peace. Come on, somebody. God is not the author or the source of confusion. Let's look at the charge here that Luke gave us in Luke chapter 21. Look at this. Now, as the Lord tarries, or if the Lord tarries, however you want to say that, I believe things are only going to get worse. How many would say amen? I mean, the, the world's just going to get worse and things are going to get worse and, and we're just going to get pulled and stretched and, and that's why we're really going to have to stop and focus. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for it's in him that we live, we move, and we have our very being. So we got to keep our eyes on the prize. Look at your neighbor and tell him, keep your eyes on the prize. Don't get distracted. Look at this. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. He says, take heed to yourselves. Not to your neighbor, not to the world, not to anyone else, but to yourself. Why? Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. Now there's the bad things, but here's the good things. And cares of this life. How many know we got to work, we got to go to school, we got to make a living? And cares of this life that that day, which is the day of the Lord, would come on you unexpectedly. Church, can I tell you right now, this is the devil's agenda. He wants to get you so busy doing stuff that you miss what God's about to do in your life. Hello? We see here that we are not to be overcharged with servietine and the cares of life and making a living such as too much school, too much work, too much sports, too much this, too much that. In fact, too much of anything. You say, but pastor, you don't know me. I'm lazy. I'm a couch potato. I sit on the couch and I watch TV all day. How can I be? Well, you know what? You're overcharged with that then. Amen. Got it? Do we see it? Is the light bulb coming on now? Too much of anything is a bad thing. Look what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus. Boy, it's hard to be balanced, isn't it? Ephesus, or Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Look at this, what Paul says. And he says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Boy, don't we live in an excessive generation. Man, everything is just excessive. Supersize this and supersize that, and more is better. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled. Everybody say, be filled. Be filled, be filled with what? MTV, B E T, C M T, T N T. Oh, it's got to be be filled with Fox News. No, be filled with the Spirit. Church, if we ever needed the Holy Ghost, we need the Holy Ghost now. Pastor Greg preached it last Sunday night. We need the Holy Ghost. I said, we need the Holy Ghost. Let me share it with you real quick. I, I think I shared it last Sunday night. I was standing right there during the altar service, and uh, Brother Justin was singing. Pastor Greg was leading the altar service, and they were singing. We were worshiping. It was a deep time of worship. And they had on the screen, how many remember that fire that they had up on the screen up here? So I was, I was standing right there, and I had my eyes closed, and the Lord showed me like this bowl. It looked like this, 
like a brown laver looking type bowl thing. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that is. I opened my eyes and I was right there on the screen and the fire was like that. And so I closed my eyes again and this time I seen the bowl, but then I seen the fire in it. And the Lord says, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, as all this was going on, I began to think in my mind, and I began to reason with the Lord, and I said, Lord, I thought the most important thing I needed was the Word of God. I've always thought that. I've always taught that, that you have to stand on the Word. But here, listen to me. Some things can't be taught. They have to be caught. Can I tell you, you can't teach spirit. you got to catch spirit. You got to open wide your spirit, man, and say, okay, listen, don't ever worry that God's going to give you anything that's bad. Hello? God is only going to give you good stuff. And I promise you, if you're sincere and you're honest and you're open, God's only going to give you good things. Look at your neighbor, Tom. Don't be scared of the Holy Ghost. So I'm standing right here and I'm thinking, well, Lord, I, I, I always thought it was the word. Because I know too much of the word, we dry up. Too much of the spirit, we blow up. But together, we put them the right combination, we grow up. And I was thinking, Lord, I always thought the emphasis had to be on the word. That was the most important thing. That, that, that is what was going to keep me, was the word. And he said this. He said, well, if, you, if all you have is the word and you don't have enough spirit, that word's going to become dry to you. And it's going to become words like a textbook, and it's not going to mean to you what it meant to you. Hello? I said it's not going to mean to you what it meant to you. Can I tell you it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Ghost and fire that brings all things into remembrance. Come on, somebody. The Bible says stir up the gift of God that's within you. Somebody say thank God for the Holy Ghost. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Church, if we ever needed the Holy Ghost, we need it now. How many know the Holy Spirit is the thing that's going to keep us? In fact, the Bible talks about this. Never does it say that the Word is going to seal us to the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of promise seals us to the day of... That's a whole other message. I ain't got time to go there. I believe right now the church needs a one-track mind. Look at your neighbor and tell him you need a one-track mind. I love you, and I think the world of you, but sometimes you got too much stuff going on. Hello? I know I do. Trying to go here and go there, not say no to anybody and do everything that I'm supposed to do. You know what? I need a one-track mind. I said, I need a one-track mind. We need to be focused on our vision. We need to be focused on the work of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Now, you might want to write this down. The Lord and the work of the Lord needs and deserves our full-time attention. The Lord and the work of the Lord not only needs, but deserves our full-time attention. You say, well, I can't go full-time in the ministry. Well, I understand that. But how many know we can be mindful about the things of God while we're at school while we're at home, while we're at work. Come on, somebody. See, what the problem is, the devil wants to get us so busy and our minds running so fast that when we get out there in the world, we forget about why we're here. We forget about our spiritual presence to the world. We forget about our spiritual importance to the world because if we aren't sharing the gospel, then who is? Look at your neighbor and tell him you have a purpose in this life. Look at this in Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, look at this. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. How many love the chastening and correction that the Lord gives us? It's a good thing, amen? Amen. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. And can I tell you right now, judgment isn't a bad thing. Judgment means I love you, so I'm going to correct you. 
It's the wrath of God that we got to be scared of. So judgment is a good thing. When judgment begins at the house of God, it's a good thing. Look at this, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, now watch this. This is what I want us to see. Write the vision and make it plain on tables or tablets. In other words, that is clarity of vision. Everybody say clarity of vision. That's the clarity of vision. We know who we are in Christ. We know why we're here. We know what we're to do. Come on, somebody. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. And now go ahead. Let's read this. Verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Everybody say wait for it. Boy, how many know we live in an impatient society? If you don't, if you don't believe we live in an impatient society, society, just go up here to the red light. And when the light turns green, just sit there for like two seconds and see what happens. You better hope I'm not behind you. Ah. (laughs) Look at your neighbor and say, he's telling the truth. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. In other words, it's not going to tarry forever. How many believe some things are worth waiting for? I believe it. But notice here how the vision will come to pass when God says it will come to pass. Not until God says it will come to pass. But yet, I do believe we can cause the vision to come more quickly by doing our part and by focusing our attention. How many understand the children of Israel when they left Egyptian bondage They had just a short jaunt of how many days? Was it like 11 days or something? Yeah, it it was just maybe two weeks at the most, and it took them 40 years. How many know they were their own worst enemy? Pharaoh's army was not their worst enemy, I'm telling you right now. Look at your name and tell them, learn the lesson you need to learn. Learn what you need to learn. The vision will come to pass when God says it will come to pass, but I believe we can hasten the day more quickly by focusing our attention, doing what we need to do, taking care of our business. Now, let me say this. God needs you to focus right now. Okay? If the Lord needs anything out of his church right now, it's for us to stop and focus. Because there's so many things vying for our time, for our energy. Hello? And I'm, I, like I said, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm just like you. I live in the same world you do. Man, there is a million and one things to do. And now that the weather's getting nice, guess what? It's only going to get worse. We got to mow the grass. We got to open the pool. We got to plant them flowers. We got to plant that garden. We got to do this. We got to do that. That's all fine, but we got to keep things in priority, don't we? Somebody say, Lord, help me. Look at your neighbor and tell them, God needs you to focus right now. And let me say this. On the good side of it, the spiritual sense, there's a million and one things we could be doing, but how many know we need to do what God wants us to do, what he's called us to do? So let me say that. As a church, as an individual, we need to find out what God's will for our life is, and we need to walk in, and how many would say amen? How many believe that the kingdom of God needs and deserves our full attention? Amen. How many know there's, there's no such thing as a part-time Christian? I mean, he, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Right? I mean, we know these things, but sometimes we just got to be reminded, don't we? I believe God needs his church to have a one-track mind. One vision. Hello? Speak with one voice. Boy, that's tough in today's society where anything goes. Look what the Apostle Paul told the church at Philippi here in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, look at this, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, Brethren, 
I do not count myself to have apprehended, but 23 things I do every day. 12 things I do. Well, don't be lazy, Paul. I mean, do a little something, wouldn't you? No, he says one thing, but one thing. Everybody say, but one thing. Listen, but one thing. What part of that don't we understand? But one thing. Everybody say, but one thing. Look at your neighbor and tell him one means one. Man, I feel that. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Woo! Somebody say, let it go, honey. Don't let your past keep you from your future. Don't let your past keep you from your destiny in Jesus. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. Somebody say, I press. Ooh, I press, I push, I endure, I fight. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but it sounds like to me that Paul had a one-track mind. This one thing I do. Lord, help us to get this. You see, this is exactly where the battle is at today. It's in our mind. Somebody say, it's in my mind. Do you have any idea what your mind hears and sees in any one given week? It's the grace of God that any of us are here today. I'm just saying. What we see and hear on a daily basis through television, the internet, newspaper, magazines, Old boy at work, at school, talking crazy, acting crazy, cussing up a storm. Come on, somebody. What we see, what we hear, what, hey, what's entering our psyche and we don't even realize it. You say, you believe in that stuff? Yeah, I do. That's why we've got to guard our eye gate. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. We've got to guard our ear gate. Well, be careful, little ears, what you hear. How many know your eyes and your ears are the gate to your soul? And they first go through your mind. And your mind will either filter it out or it won't. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I got so much to say. Long, long ways to go and a short time to get there. So Paul knew what it meant to have a one-track mind. And that's exactly where we're at today. It's the battle of the mind. And, man, I, I try not to give the devil too much credit, but how many know he's good at what he does? He's good at what he does, and he wants in your head. Look at your neighbor and tell him the devil wants in your head. I mean, he wants to mess you up. He wants you to steal, and he wants to steal and kill your peace and your joy and your strength, and yeah, yeah. You see, the devil will do anything, and he will use anybody to get inside your head and mess with your mind. The devil is not only a liar, but he's the father of lies. He's the best liar. Come on, somebody. How many know some pretty good liars? All right, you know what I'm talking about that. The devil is the best liar, hands down. And the devil will lie to you, and he will get inside your head, and he will mess with your mind. Come on, somebody. And he will convince you that something's going on when there ain't even nothing going on. Well, she said this. Well, he did that. You ain't ever going to be anybody. You're going to go back to the old person you were. Come on, you know the devil is a liar. Look what the Apostle Paul had to say to the church at Rome here in Romans chapter 12. How many know it's time to kick the devil out of our minds? We let the devil in our mind. He controls our whole body. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present. Everybody say that you present. In other words, you got to give it up. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to give it up, honey. God ain't going to take it from you. you got to present your bodies a what? A dead old sacrifice? No, a living sacrifice. That means you got to die daily. Woo. you got to die to become a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is only your reasonable service. In other words, it's only what's expected. It's not above and beyond the call of duty. 
Verse 2, look at this. And do not be conformed to this world. Oh, my. Do we need to stop right there? We could park right there, but I ain't got time. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Be transformed how? By the renewing of your what? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, let me just tell you right now, the devil will use anything and everything to plant seeds into your mind. He will plant seeds of doubt, fear, unbelief, confusion. How many know sin is conceived in the mind? How many know you will never do anything unless you first think about it, both good and evil? It all starts here. Somebody put your hand up here, your finger up here. It all starts right here. That's why it's the battle of the mind. It all starts right here. And Paul says we are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as a child of God, our minds must be renewed not on a weekly basis, but on a daily basis. Ooh, my. You try to go a week without renewing your mind, you're going to be in trouble. You ain't even probably going to make it back to the house of God next Sunday. Come on, somebody. The old saying is so true. It's so simple, but it's so true. Garbage in. That's it. That's it. We feed on the world. We feed on crap. We're going to get crap. Come on, somebody. Look what Paul said here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, and as this goes on, the list just gets smaller and smaller of what we can choose from. Come on, somebody. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, how many see the elimination process going on? Whatever things are lovely, whatever are things of good report, if there be any virtue and if there is any praiseworthy thing, meditate or think on these things. So if you read this verse closely, you will see that this filters out a lot of things. In fact, you ain't going to find much of anything like that in our world today. Let me say that again. There is hardly anything in our world today worth allowing to come into our greatest asset called the mind. <laughs> Lord, help us to see this. Our mind should be the filter that filters out all the bad before it takes root in our heart. Amen? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, guard your mind. Look at your neighbor and tell him, guard your mind. If you're a soldier in the army of the Lord, the first thing you need to learn to guard is your mind. Oh, but I got I got I got my brother and sister's back. I got to do this. I'm the pastor's armor bearer. I got to do this. I got to do. No, honey. The first thing you got to do is you got to take care of your own business. You got to handle your own business, and you got to guard your own mind. I can't guard your mind. You can't guard my mind. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're in charge of your mind. If you want to fill it full of garbage, go ahead. But guess what? You reap what you sow. I said, you reap what you sow. It might not be immediately, but eventually you're going to reap what you sow. Do you still love your pastor this morning? Let me say this. We will never have a one-track mind until we first learn to guard our mind. Our minds are such a valuable asset. No wonder the devil wants to mess with our minds. Let me say this. My mind will either make me or break me. Let me say it again. My mind will either make me or break me. How many's ever how many's ever said this? My mind's playing tricks on me. Sure, we all have. I'm telling you. The devil ain't playing with this. He will use your weakness. He will use whatever to mess with your mind and to steal your victory. The devil will lie to you and, and tell you people don't love you. Nobody in the church loves you. You might as well not go. They think that you're fat. They think you're ugly. You think you're da 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 
Woo, look at the bottom of your feet and say, devil, you're a liar in the name of Jesus. Get out of here. Mm, 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 mm. Our minds will either make us or break us. And that's why the devil wants to control our minds. The bad thing about it, man, I hate the devil. The bad thing about it, the devil will use our flesh to control our minds. He'll give the flesh what we want. <laughs> Let me say this. The devil always shows up with exactly everything you want. And he offers that to you and say, here you go. You deserve this. Hello? You deserve this, so go ahead, indulge yourself. All right, I ain't got time to go there. The Bible plainly says the spirit is willing, but the... The Bible says give no place to the... Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will... Look at this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and what? And minds through Christ Jesus. Man, I know our hearts are important. I know our never dying eternal souls are important. But our mind has so much to do with it. I believe my mind will determine where my soul will spend eternity. Again, I say the battle fought, but the battlefield is in your mind. It's in my mind. Look at this quickly. I'm trying to hurry. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their what? Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to their spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. Okay? Everybody see the difference? For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So in other words, it's a choice. Everybody say it's a choice. Choose wisely. Verse 7, because the carnal man is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Hmm. Hmm. So then, as a child of God, as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, my mind belongs to God. Now help me out here. Come on, somebody. Does my mind really belong to God? I am not my own, but I have been bought with a great price. Come on, somebody. I am to present my body as a living sacrifice. My mind is part of me just as much as my soul and my heart is part of me. So, yes, I can have the mind of Christ. My mind belongs to God. Make that declaration right now. My mind belongs to God. Devil, you can't have it. Flesh, you can't have it. My mind belongs to the Lord. Look at this. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If then you were raised up with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting. Woo, my goodness, I'm about to get happy. <laughs> where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set. Everybody say set. How many understand set is a choice and set is an action word? Woo, let me say it again. Set is a choice and set is an action word. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Look at this. I got to hurry. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Look at this. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind... Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ooh, my goodness. My mind is so important. My mind is so valuable to me. My goodness. Now, finally, in closing, let's look at what Paul said to the church at Corinth. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 3 through 5. Praise team, you can make your way this way if you would please. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Although sometimes they do manifest themselves in the flesh, they are not carnal, but mighty in God. 
Everybody say mighty in God. How many know the battle's not ours, but it's God's? Ooh, I want you to encourage your neighbor. I want you to look at somebody, some somebody, and I want you to say, the battle's not yours, but the victory is. Oh, tell the other person, the battle's not yours, but the victory is. Ooh, I'm about to preach myself happy. Where in the world was I? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Boy, there's a lot of that going on today. But how many know God is greater? I said he's greater. <laughs> Ooh. Now watch this. Bringing every what? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Woo. Church, if we ever needed to train our brain, we need to train our brain now. My Lord, have mercy, Jesus. We need to train our brain. Can I tell you, every problem we're facing, it's our stinking thinking. I'm telling you. Oh, but pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You know, yeah, I understand that. And yeah, the, the attacks are, are great and so on and so forth. But if we had the mind of Christ, and if we could see and perceive and see things the way God sees them, hello? Oh, Jesus. Let me say this. We've already talked about the eye gate the ear gate. And before I say that, let me say this. God is not going to condemn us if we have a bad thought. How many has a bad thought from time to time? Yeah, it happens. You see something, you hear something, something comes to your mind, yeah. That's that's the human part of it. That's not a sin. But when you don't take that thought into captivity and begin to think about that thought and not kick it out, that's when the problem starts. Hello? Any, any sinner saved by grace in the house? Okay, okay. Man, you scared me there for a minute. I thought it was only me. But it's not the fact that it's that thought that occurs. It's what we do with that thought. That's what's so important. So let me say this. We must guard our thoughts because our thoughts become our words. We must guard our words because our words become our actions. We must guard our actions because our actions determine our destiny. Our actions define who we are as an individual. But it all begins with a simple thought. Paul said, think on these things. Think on these things. Church, I believe it's time for the child of God to have a one-track mind. Listen, even if, even if the world says we're closed mind, I'd rather be closed minded about this than to be so open-minded that my brains fall out, that I lose my spiritual equilibrium. Come on, somebody. You can call, you can call me closed minded if you want to. But when the rapture happens, you're going to call me gone, honey. Call me old school. Call me old fashioned. But when the trumpet God God sounds, you're going to call me gone. Mm, Jesus, I got to quit. It's time for the church to put on the mind of Christ. Stand with me. (laughs) My goodness, I got to have the mind to quit. Or I'm just going to keep, keep preaching. <laughs> How many know you got to have a mind to start? you got to have a mind to quit sometimes. Woo, pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness. And yes, Lord, we pray right now for the Holy Spirit to come and to seal this word, not only in our hearts, but seal this word in our mind right now. Father, I pray that we perceive and understand Lord, I pray for divine revelation and illumination of your word. Father, we thank you for your goodness.